Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I can see or can tell from the list of participants that the ladies are far in the majority. Um, my name is Tijn Atre. I am the director of UXIA, the University Centre St. Ignatius, Antwerp, and we have here a session in our uh, lecture series, European Values, Citizen Citizenship and Belonging, and, and I'm chairing this session for you and uh, replacing here uh, Helene Touquet, who is holder of the chair for European values, but who could not be present tonight for personal uh, reasons. Um, before I introduce to you uh, the speakers of tonight, I go, to some, uh, go through some technical issues. So if you have any problems, uh, you can uh, contact the moderator, uh, Marijke Selis, by sending a chat uh, message to her. Um, you can also see that this session is right now being recorded, so you should know about that. Um, you cannot speak uh, and you will not be visible uh, in this uh, webinar because uh, default uh, the participants uh, are muted and their uh, video cameras are disabled. Um, so if you want to ask questions to the speakers you can use the public chat the chat to everyone and you can use that by clicking on the, the arrow the right uh, hand corner of your screen you have uh, a fuchsia colored arrow or uh, another you can uh, open and there you can adjust settings of, of this session so uh, disable pop up messages for example uh, yeah, and you can also, via the uh, text balloon, you can see their chat to uh, everyone and ask questions to the speakers. But since we are uh, not so numerous, it might well be that we uh, uh, had a Q&A session where we can also uh, maybe uh, switch on the microphone of the participants. We'll see that uh, in one hour or so. I mentioned the timing. Well, um, it's clear that uh, we, well, what, while we uh, transformed the original program to a webinar format, we will uh, have a shorter timing now. Eh? So we aim at uh, ending the presentations by uh, 7 at latest, and then we have the Q&A. So at 7.30 at latest, we are done, and maybe even earlier. So not until 8 o'clock, as indicated uh, on the website or in your uh, the last message you received from us. OK, that's about the technical issues. I mentioned Helene Touquet, Professor Helene Touquet, holder of the Chair for European Values. Um, she has recorded a message for us, and if all goes well, technically, uh, we can now listen to this message as Marek Selis will now initiate the video. We had some technical issues with it, with the sound, so we'll see if it works out. If not, uh, we just tell the message ourselves. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I am Helene Touquet. I'm the Chair in European Values at the University of Antwerp. The role of the Chair in European Values is to stimulate debate and reflection on the meaning of European values. And this is what we'll be doing tonight with this discussion on the refugee crisis and European values um, with uh, Professor Lilian Surdi and Professor Philippe de Breuker. But before go, we go off to that, uh, I wanted to recommend you uh, a recent book uh, that I've edited. Uh, the book is called Whose Values, What Values? And it consists of conversations that I've had with uh, three people who took part in this public lecture series, Peter Verofschek, Cynthia Miller Idris and François Fouet. And in this book, we talk about the different meanings of European values for different generations, the issues of politics of memory and how they have shaped the meaning of European values over the past decades, as well as the impact of COVID-19 and the extreme right on uh, European values. So I want to, to recommend this book to you. If you're interested, it will be published tomorrow by ASP Publishers and you can check it on their website or you can order it from your, uh, from your bookstore. Thank you for listening and I hope you will enjoy the debate. So that was Helene's message to us. Uh, very kind of her to uh, share this message with us. I'm now trying to show you a slide 
about the book. So there you have it. What values, whose values, very interesting book. So um, I would say uh, buy it and read it in interview form. So it's a bit more lively in writing uh, than, than just a um, scientific article or an essay. Good. So then I have the honor to introduce uh, to you the first uh, speaker of tonight. But I've seen that both uh, Lilian Tsurdi and uh, Professor Philippe de Bruyker, uh, or de Bruyker, are members of the Odysseus uh, Network. And of course, that is a very nice name uh, to refer to a refugee crisis to the, to the issue of migration, the figure of Odysseus, who had come so many troubles, finally uh, settle again in Ithaca, uh, his homeland finally have a stable place to live in to overcoming obstacles uh, i wonder what are the the sirens of uh, asylum policy the pitfalls to avoid what are the Silla and the charybdis uh, we should navigate in be in between uh, when we're talking about migration crisis and uh, migration policy or asylum uh, policy and maybe the story of the cyclope the one-eyed cyclope uh, applies most to the refugee situation because sometimes maybe European bureaucracy can be compared to a white cyclo giant, uh, um, keeping some uh, yeah, uh, possible immigrants, uh, refugees, maybe in a kind of prison. And uh, the only way they can escape is by be becoming nobody, as Odysseus uh, invented as a ruse to get past the giant and to escape. But in this situation, the situation of migrants sometimes becoming nobody is uh, their fate without any choice, not being a ruse, but just brutal fate. And we should never forget about that, that some people are slipping through the mazes of the, the nets, so to speak, through the, the, the holes of the. So that being said, um, I introduce you all to uh, Professor Lilian Tsurdi. Professor Lilian Tsurdi is assistant professor and Dutch Research Council grantee to the Law Faculty of Maastricht University, as well as visiting professor at Sciences Po, Sciences Politique, Political Sciences, Paris. She is a member of the coordination team of the Academic Network for Legal Studies on Immigration and Asylum in Europe. So that is the Odysseus Network I mentioned. Lilian was previously a lecturer in international human rights and refugee law the Refugee Studies Center of the University of Oxford and a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute. She obtained her PhD from the law faculty of the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Her research interests lie at the intersection of EU law, public international law, and public policy administ administration with a focus on human rights, asylum, migration, and governance theories. She has been awarded two grants as principal investigator, the Marie Klodowska Curie Individual Fellowship by the European Commission and the Veni grant, grant by the Dutch Research Council. Her monograph on the constitutional foundations and administrative govern, governance of the EU asylum policy is forthcoming in Oxford University Press next year. Is that so? Jan, we are very honored that you're with us night and so i grant you happily the floor thank you thank you stain can you all hear me well i hope so i'm very honored we can hear you well so go on. you can hear me hear you well. that's excellent yes. i'm very honored with this invitation and I also especially appreciated the imagery of uh, Odysseus stain, since I'm Greek also by origin. Uh, this is where I originally come from, or I went to all those places that you mentioned. Uh, so let's see today more closely uh, the travel of refugees to come to Europe and any parallels that we can with the story of uh, Odysseus. So I will be also timing myself. As you said, this is uh, an online webinar, and I understand that it's much more difficult uh, to remain focused. So I will try uh, to discuss with you the issues that I wanted to raise uh, in the 
30 minute time frame. So I will start now sharing the PowerPoint that I have also presented. I hope everything will be fine. Do you see that thing? Could you confirm? I don't see it yet. <laughs> okay. Um, you want me to start it? Yes, if possible. So it should be coming right now. Okay. Excellent. So we will be focusing on the refugee crisis, and this I put under parenthesis. We will discuss further solidarity and uh, values. And I start with two pictures that unfortunately have grown quite accustomed to, alongside with crisis uh, vocabulary and discourse pictures of boatloads of individuals arriving in Europe in unseaworthy boats, or pictures of refugees in unsanitary camps. And this is a photograph from Moria, the hotspot in Lesbos, in Greece. Uh, and all of this has unfortunately become commonplace. So how is it possible that refugees must risk their lives trying to reach protection in Europe. And for the lucky few that do, how is it possible that they could then find themselves in such substandard conditions? So in this talk, I will reconstruct Europe's refugee crisis. And that's why I put it also in quotation marks, because I argue that it is actually a crisis of EU values and governance. And I will do that in two stages. First, I will retrace the gradual erosion of free foundational. And these are fundamental rights, solidarity, and the rule of law. And next, I will engage in a comprehensive analysis of underexplored elements of asylum administrative governance. And I will also explain what administrative governance is exactly. So I will assess limitation in the EU's asylum system implementation design and shifts in the administrative architecture. And I will conclude with some critical uh, remarks on the symptoms of this crisis of EU values and governance, while I will offer also uh, some comments on EU's new approach, the so new pact on migration and asylum that was released on the 23rd of September by the European Commission, in which perhaps several of the participants already had the possibility to read and hear about. So I will start, as I said, with erosion uh, of three foundational concepts. And the first one is the erosion of fundamental rights protection. So EU asylum law and policy is characterized by two related foundational tensions. First is the one between commitment to protection, obligations, and the action impetus. And the second concerns the tension between EU's embedded commitment to the normalization of cross-border mobility across the territory of the member states versus the mobility of asylum seekers and refugees under EU law. So most of you uh, will be aware of member states' international refugee and human rights law obligations, and these underpin the development of the EU asylum policy. I am referring here to legal instruments such as the 1951 Refugee Convention and other relevant treaties. And EU asylum legislation, in the case of the Court of Justice, again and again affirm EU's commitment to international refugee and human rights law. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights also contains the right to asylum, which it views as creating an individual right, although, to be honest, 
the Court of Justice has avoided so far to clarify its scope. But EU's commitment to protection emerged in tandem with attempts to ensure that few asylum seekers will be able to reach the territory of EU mandates to claim asylum. These so-called containment practices are a feature of the global refugee regime. In many ways, they are uh, led by European states and the EU alongside the United States and Australia. So we do see uh, a certain policy transfer, policy transplants, uh, if you wish, as Daniel Gezelbash uh, has actually defined it, of containment practice across rich states and regions. So this is not something unique uh, to the EU. So what are exactly containment practices? Well, they first ensure that refugees and potential refugees lack legal means. So the first method is to require those in need of protection to have a regular visa to enter by placing the countries of origin of those likely international protection on the so-called EU visa blacklist. However, normal travel and migration visas usually stipulate that risk of overstaying is a ground for rejection. So any applicant who is likely to claim protection will not normally be granted a visa. Then a related uh, strategy is that of carrier sanctions, which privatize migration controls and ensure that those without visas cannot travel by means of regular flights and ferries. So together, these measures render illegal that certain would be entrants, and they create markets for illicit travel services. Once the travel of those seeking protection is made illegal, EU asylum policy becomes fundamentally in tension with the national EU treaty commitment that fights illegal migration. Moreover, extraterritorial border controls make it practically difficult to leave home and third states as the EU co opts potential states of origin and transit in its border control regime. So, an apparently obvious answer refugee containment is to design refugee-specific legal modes to enter the EU so as to seek protection. However, legal entry routes remain scarce. Refugee containment does not seal the EU's external border from asylum seekers. However, entering the EU irregularly is possible, but it is risky. And these risks are borne by refugees and others traveling illegally. So this is the first foundational tension. The second foundational tension is that between internal mobility, I'm referring to internal mobility within uh, the EU, and mobilization of protection service. European coordination of asylum policy began outside the framework of the EU. And early initiatives were largely conceived as flanking to the competition of the internal market and the abolition of internal border controls. It was Vincent Chetay who first argued that the political motivation for EU asylum policies must be found in a factor that is external to refugee protection and it is intrinsically linked to the political, political construction of the EU. So this was the will to exclude asylum seekers from the movement. This aim is not self-explanatory, but there appears to have been little basic reflection on this early policy choice. So one of the main ways the EU sought to immobilize asylum seekers was to delegitimize moving within the EU in search of protection. So the EU created mechanisms to block asylum seeker mobility, whether it be in search of better economic and legal opportunities. So in this sort of mobility, the EU internal markets normally promotes or to join family or 
even to ensure that their protection claims are properly examined. Moreover, measures to preclude the mobility of asylum seekers are not restricted to cross-border mobility. So many member states also detain asylum seekers or at least require them to reside in particular places while their claims are being assessed. And this initial premise has not been altered. The Lisbon Treaty includes a legal basis establishing uniform status of asylum for nationals of third countries. So this status would in effect create mutual recognition of positive asylum decisions. So someone who would be recognized by Greece would in essence be recognized by the EU and this would be linked with free movement, right? But such a status does not exist. So it remains the case even recognized countries of international protection have a national status. So I pass to the notion of the second foundational concept, and that is solidarity. So the principle of solidarity is central to the development of the common European asylum system. And in the analysis of EU law, generally speaking, it is often said to be a foundational principle. But there is controversy over whether it should be viewed as a binding legal principle or as a political norm, political aspiration. So although this solidarity is foundational in the Treaty on European Union, those provisions are largely aspiration. And the status of solidarity as a binding general principle of law is uh, highly uh, controversial. However, we have more specific expressions of solidarity, if you will, which appear in different provisions of the EU treaties. And one such expression of solidarity exists specifically in relation to asylum, migration, and external border controls, and it is a quite far reaching statement, principle of solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility that should underpin EU's asylum policy. It should profoundly impact the goal of the policy, dictate a certain quality in the cooperation uh, among the different actors, and arguably also unsettle its implementation mode. So our asylum uh, related solidarity does create binding legal obligations and in fact should impact both legislative and the implementation phases. The article not only permits but in fact requires the adoption of concrete measures whenever necessary. As we have a reference of solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility, this means that we have, in essence, a solidarity plus. So the aim is to provide support up to the point which member state is contributing its fair share. More ambitiously, the objective should be to structure the policy and its implementation in such a way that symmetrical burdens occur in the first place. So as I have described it notably, solidarity is a vital principle in the context of the common European asylum system. Merely limiting its scope to partial palliative measures is not enough. It arguably requires new measures to offset those effects of the common European asylum systems that existing solidarity measures do not compensate for. I have argued even that it would require a redesign of the common European asylum system legislative instruments and possibly its implementation mode. But while this is the normative, if you will, aspirations and principled legal conclusions from the treaties, we all know that this is not the reality on the ground. So the common European asylum system currently lacks a genuine system for allocating responsibility among the member states based on objective indicators. 
Member states often assert that they are overburdened, but such claims cannot be objectively substantiated. And they raise the suspicion, among other member states, that failure to comply with EU law obligations derives not from inability, but from unwillingness. Generally speaking, the claim of migratory pressure is not based on predefined objective criteria, but is merely a certain and on a common sense basis. Even when objective criteria are evoked to support common sense assessments, example, the number of migrants arriving, there is no clarity as to whether migratory pressure should be evaluated on an absolute or relative basis. So instinctively, almost any observer would agree that the arrival of, let's say, 20,000 asylum seekers which is an objective metric, will have a different impact in Germany than in Malta. Thus, a more complete understanding of fair sharing would seek also to relativize pressure by taking into account characteristics of the receiving state, such as population, GDP, unemployment rates, and so on. Remarkably, though, even the measures that have most recently been adopted or proposed for the common European asylum system are not keyed to the relative migratory pressures faced by member states. So since solidarity and fair sharing are not structurally embedded in the system, what prevails are exceptional emergency-driven uh, responses, is how I have called them in my literature. So we have emergency deployments of EU agents, mobilization of emergency funding, emergency relocation. By that, I'm referring to intra e transfer of asylum seekers from one member state to another. So this type of responses, apart from not corresponding to the normative content of the principle of solidarity, also cannot fully address what are structural rather than exceptional needs. And I pass now to the third foundational concept, that of the rule of law. So the shared values of fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law are understood as the bedrock of European societies. And yet recent years have seen the EU plagued by the rise of populism, exclusionary nationalist discourses, racism, and xenophobia. This has been linked with challenges to the rule of law in member states. So the rule of law backsliding has related most to systemic breaches of judicial independence, harassment of civil society organization and educational institutions, and violation of the right freedom of expression. A parallel dynamic has been the rise of violations of asylum seekers' rights, which in some member states has reached the level of systemic violation, even the level of a humanitarian emergency. So these violations relate most notably to instances of arbitrary deprivation of liberty, the subjection to inhuman or degrading treatment due to absent or extremely deficient reception conditions, processing of asylum applications that does not respect procedural standards. So while these phenomena have intensified since uh, the so-called refugee crisis 2015-2016, uh, they have long preceded it. So thus one argument is that such violations of a widespread nature which relate to four fundamental rights, such as the prohibition of inhuman and degrading are another manifestation of the rule of law crisis. And I am not alone to make uh, this. Advocate General Sharpston, in her opinion on the case, the European Commission fought against Poland and Hungary for their outright denial implement their obligations on relocation, emergency relocation, which I mentioned before, explicitly linked this backsliding protection and what seemed to be a position of principled defiance of the rule of law backsliding. Characteristically, 
that she said at the deeper level, respect for the rule of law implies compliance with one's legal obligation. Disregarding them because they are unwilling or unpopular is the first step towards the breakdown of orderly and structured society governed by the rule of law. So this concludes my first uh, set of observations on the three uh, foundational tensions. And now I pass to the second set, which are the limitations in the asylum system implementation design and involving shifts in the administrative architecture. And I did promise that I would explain what administrative governance is. So the initial implementation design of the common European asylum system was broadly underpinned by what is known by lawyers and political scientists as the theory of federalism. And this theory can be summed up as follows. So apart from exceptional cases where the EU directly implements the policies, that is direct implementation, national executives assume responsibility in the main for the application of European law, so the so-called indirect implementation. Strictly applied, this lead, leads to a neat division of labor for most policies, where legislation is adopted at EU level and the implementation of EU law is a matter of predominantly national concern. The realization of a common policy, therefore, such as the asylum policy, is secured primarily through legal harmonization. However, this theory of executive federalism increasingly fails to capture the reality of implementation of EU law and the intricate links that increasingly exist between the EU and national levels. Some examples of this more complex reality include networks and agencies. So we have a significant body of search on EU administrative law, which points to the rise of an integrated administration, which ties the old categories uh, of direct and indirect implementation. Characteristically, you have uh, Hoffman and Kerr who have said that integrated administration is not so much a multi-level system as in a hierarchy, if you want an EU level imposing itself on member states' administrations, is a system of integrated levels. All becomes one, if you will. So, what about the common European asylum system? Well, it was conceptualized, and even in the late iteration of the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, as a common system national variant. And what do I mean by that? What is common is a set of legal rules that member states are called on to implement, uh, rather than the implementation stage itself. So neither the treaties nor further legislation initially foresaw intense administrative cooperation at the implementation stage. On the contrary, each uh, member state uh, holds primary responsibility for implementation at the national level of harmonized legal rules at the EU level. So this neglects the nature of asylum provision as a common EU responsibility and a regional public, which means that contributions of one member state benefit the others. And mm, no. I'm trying to get you to the correct slide, which may be saying you can help me it's slide number. Yes. But what we have seen also in the field of asylum is the emergence of increasingly integrated administration. This has come. Uh, as a counterbalance to the lack of interstate solidarity. So don't think that it has been brought about by some kind of federalist vision, per se. It was rather a pragmatic approach to counterbalance 
uh, the lack of interstate solidarity that I described above. And what it does is that it amplifies, of course, capacities, but it is not inherently negative or, or positive. Uh, so it can be like a weapon, it can be turned into different aims also, for example, uh, for externalization. And I had two uh, examples that I wanted to share with you of what I mean. First, EU uh, funding. So EU funding is implemented under a shared management model. What I mean is that uh, we have the Commission is tasked with making uh, the relevant decisions or implement programs without for systematic uh, cooperation with national bureaucracies, that is the central funding, if you will. And in shared administration, we have the Commission and the Member States having distinct administrative tasks, which are interdependent, and they both discharge their roles for the European policy to be implemented successfully. So we have the member state proposing national programs with different activities that then they draw from EU funding in order to implement. And the Commission comes there on a discussive programming role and then does an additional layer of checks, but it's not there as the organ to implement, to distribute, for example, this part of funds in shared management. The second example is agencification, and by that I am referring to greater involvement of EU agencies in implementation, which is one of the most notable uh, recent shifts in EU's asylum policy. And I specifically refer to the EU agency EASO, so the European Asylum Support Office, and just one of the facet of its activities, which is its involvement in refugee status determination, so in examining applications. Its involvement in processing asylum applications, its new operational support was always a part of its mandate, and it deployed asylum support teams to assist member states. However, these teams at the beginning were not hands-on, they were not operational. They did not interact with asylum seekers. So their work consisted of providing expert advice, training, and so on. But in the aftermath of priest arrivals in 2015-2016, EASO staff and deployed national experts began to undertake more hands-on tasks, such as providing information, for example, to those arriving. As pressure increased, we had forms of joint processing emerging in Greece, uh, whereby EASO and the Greek Asylum Service share the tasks of processing asylum requests in order to reduce uh, Greece's workload. So experts deployed by EASO are independently conducting admissibility interviews on behalf of the Greek Asylum System. They then uh, submit their findings on which uh, the Greek Asylum Service issues the final admissibility uh, decision. Since 2018, we have Greek-speaking ASO staff involved also in examining the merits of the asylum claims. And these developments have not yet been coupled with a formal review of EASO's legal mandate. So EASO's role, this EU agency, has shifted significantly. This has incrementally led to the emergence of patterns of joint implementation. So joint implementation patterns and the augmentation of financial, financial and human resources could be the precursors of deeper forms of integration between the EU and national administration. And again, this should be viewed as a pragmatic approach to enhance solidarity and the sharing of responsibility. However, these initial experiences in Greece, as I mentioned before, they illustrate that enhanced administrative 
integration should not be met with qualified acclamation. It brings with it its own challenges, and in this case, calls for a rethink of accountability processes and EU procedural law so that it does not lead to a watering down of procedural guarantees in practice. And I will close with some thoughts on the so called impact on migration and asylum. I cannot go, of course, into all the nitty gritty of all these instruments, more than 300 pages for those who have already uh, engaged with them. So, what the new pact uh, does it is that it embeds this kind of continuum of migration management. Uh, blaring uh, the lines between the policies of external border control, asylum, and return. And it also does prime externalization return over other considerations. In terms of the administrative, if you want, setup and design, it has not sufficiently moved away uh, from the initial design. So more centralized funding, for example, or resources or a broader rethink implementation would be necessary. And if we make a cross check uh, with uh, the fundamental values, foundational values uh, that I developed in the first part of my talk, well, in what concerns fundamental rights, it risks a further dilution of guarantees as it primes externalization and return. So in order to achieve these aims, procedural guarantees and further uh, guarantees could be sacrificed. In terms of solidarity, interstate solidarity, it does uh, advocate for the idea of mandatory but flexible uh, solidarity. This is and more from this thinking of uh, asylum, but also external border control being regional uh, public goods. But it is recent of this trade off uh, in Schengen uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. So let's create a protection system, but immobilize asylum. So here uh, it is more about non entry and uh, return. And about the rule of law, it seems to accept this backsliding of a protection uh, that I mentioned, because, for example, on uh, the element of emergency relocation, which has been a big political and also legal battle, it accepts, for example, that a member state may choose not to contribute in the area of asylum, not uh, to take asylum seekers on its ground, for example, this emergency relocation, but instead to sponsor return. So it says it is fine if you make a contribution, but in fact in another policy from those in the continuum, in that of return. But I didn't want uh, to close this talk with completely negative picture and a negative overview with the pact. So this is why my final words will be those of the audacity of hope. So hope, which is brought about not so much uh, by these plans, but of grassroots movements and mobilization of movements uh, such that in the Netherlands, the Haaland, so we are going to bring them speaking about communities, local communities wishing to integrate, to relocate uh, refugees. And we see a big disjunction often between the formal, if you will, central official level and the regional level, where regional authorities and local communities are ready to welcome. Uh, resettle, relocate individuals and make them part of our European societies.
So I would rather close with the audacity of hope and I thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, so much, Lilian, for this uh, thought-provoking lecture. Um, yeah, you've really delivered what uh, we might expect from the title of your lecture. So you you uh, went into more depth about erosion of fundamental rights, solidarity, and the rule of law uh, pertaining to migration and asylum policies. Then you uh, focus um, at the level of uh, EU governance. And you indicated some flaws there eh, where this uh, EU governance actually contributes to this erosion of these uh, three uh, fundamental European values. We're talking about Euro European values eh, uh, tonight. And then uh, it was very interesting that you uh, discussed also the new pact. And I, I liked uh, how you concluded eh, that we have the, the political and juridical level, but we also have the morals of civil society and of groups. So. Uh, Going more or going beyond actually what uh, legal frameworks or policymakers ask society to do. So it's very uh, hopeful that that exists, that level is still existing. So and is still active in many societies in Europe. So uh, I, I would like to go more in, in, into detail about many things of your lecture. I think the audience will do that also. But uh, for now, the first one who is going to respond to your lecture, you know him very well, of course. He's uh, your uh, 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 cherished uh, colleague, I suppose, is Professor Philip de Bruyker. He is a lawyer specialist in specialized in uh, European immigration and asylum law, uh, free movement of European citizens, and comparative aliens law. He's teaching and researching in those fields at the Institute for European Studies at the Université Libre de Bruxelles uh, in Belgium. He coordinates the Odysseus academic network for legal studies in, on immigration and asylum in Europe, which he founded in 1999. And he's also Jean Monnet Chair of European Law on Immigration and Asylum. Professor Breuker, I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, good night, everybody. I hope that uh, there are no technical uh, problems. We hear you very clearly, so go on, everything fine. Perfect. I'm, uh, I'm of course, very pleased to have the possibility to make comments after the, the speech of uh, Lillian tonight, because, uh, well, uh, I had the chance that uh, uh, to supervise the, the PhD of, uh, of Lillian a few years ago, and it's, of course, always uh, an, an enormous pleasure uh, to see that uh, uh, people grow, that uh, they build uh, their uh, career. And you had the possibility to listen about the CV uh, of Lillian, where she has been, Oxford, the European University Institute, the grants that she received. So uh, I have to say uh, that to have an academic child like uh, uh, Lillian is really a, a pleasure and something uh, about which uh, I am uh, proud. So let me uh, start with my uh, comments. And actually, I will make one about the past and uh, one actually about the uh, future. So about the past, in order to try to explain what is really the problem that we cannot solve, we uh, have to keep in mind that actually Dublin, the Dublin system of allocation of uh, responsibility in case of an asylum uh, request, this uh, Dublin mechanism was invented uh, actually by the five states who drafted, who prepared the Schengen Convention. So the Benelux, uh, France uh, and uh, uh, Germany. I'm not totally sure about the intention, actually, of uh, the inventors uh, of uh, the mechanism. And I think that it would be extremely interesting to have historians going to look uh, into the archives to try uh, to understand what they really uh, had uh, in uh, mind. I am not sure that the goal was to immobilize uh, uh, asylum uh, seeker or uh, uh, refugees. 
I am afraid that it was uh, only a way for each member state to uh, take care of its own uh, number of uh, asylum seekers, not at all solidarity, but uh, on the contrary, everybody taking care of the asylum seekers arriving on its uh, territory. And this was, of course, not the problem when you think that it was about five member states from the north, quite rich, uh, quite uh, similar, and you could expect that uh, between uh, them you would not have uh, a lot of uh, uh, asylum shopping uh, or uh, secondary uh, movement. But then, of course, the, the problem came from the fact that the Dublin uh, system has uh, been uh, taken over by all the other member states, uh, bit uh, by bit. For instance, Italy uh, joined uh, also the uh, Dublin uh, system. And all the uh, southern uh, member states of the uh, European uh, Union. And once again, it, it would be very interesting to, uh, is to have an, an historical look at, well, the intention of the Italians, who they're aware or not about uh, the problem that they would have to face with uh, signing, uh, the, with accepting the Dublin uh, mechanism. And then further on, there has been the enlargement of 2004, and there was no choice for the new member states to uh, accept or refuse Dublin. It was part of the uh, package. Why is that a problem? Well, because not in theory, as you see it's written, in uh, the uh, regulation, but in practice, the effect of the Dublin system is that asylum seekers are supposed to be taken care by the uh, member states of first entry. So all refugees entering the EU through Greece or uh, to Italy become, because they passed for the, in the first member state, become the responsibility of uh, Greece uh, or of uh, Italy. That's the uh, uh, basic uh, of the system, and I would say this is the poison of the system, because it's very easily to understand that it's not at all based on uh, solidarity. It is, uh, you could even say that it is the contrary, and I think that solidarity was not uh, an issue for uh, the uh, five member states who invented uh, uh, that uh, mechanism. But it's a, a very big problem because it's the contrary of solidarity. So if you have to uh, correct, to minimize uh, the effect of the Dublin regulation, it's almost impossible because uh, at the root of the system, you have a bad mechanism that uh, makes it functioning against uh, solidarity. And also politically, well, the message, the political message from the Dublin regulation is that the first member state of entry is responsible. And trying to go uh, against that and to change the criteria uh, is extremely uh, difficult and has not uh, been done uh, by the Commission in its proposal uh, part of the uh, Migration uh, Pact. And I will now uh, speak a bit about the uh, migration uh, pact. First of all, well, to say what it is not. And actually, I would say it is not a pact. Because the idea, maybe uh, saying that is being a bit uh, uh, naive, but the idea was to expect really that the Commission would try to rebuild our migration and uh, asylum system and to make a uh, fresh uh, uh, proposal in line with what had been decided by the European Council before. For instance, in the Bratislava Declaration, which was uh, supported by uh, Donald Tusk when he was president of the European uh, Council, it was clearly said that there is a need to build a consensus on migration. So to try to reunify the European uh, uh, Union around the issue of migration and asylum because uh, it's been 
very uh, divided, in particular because of the system of relocation of asylum seekers that has been invented as one element of solidarity just after the uh, crisis of 2015 and 16, and that has been uh, opposed and refused by a certain number of member states, and in particular those called the V4 uh, uh, group, um, Hungary, uh, uh, Slovenia, um, uh, Slovakia, uh, the uh, Czech uh, uh, Republic, uh, and uh, Poland, I think, uh, are at uh, the core uh, of uh, the opponents to uh, the idea of uh, relocation. So, it is not a real pact because there is really no vision for uh, the uh, uh, future. And in particular, uh, regarding what uh, Lillian has mentioned as a way uh, forward, the administrative governance of the asylum policy, not only by member states alone anymore, as it is the classical principle, but uh, the uh, governance uh, of a system made of an integrated administration, the national administration still being there, but working really uh, together with the European agencies. And that's, I think, a way uh, for uh, the future. But you don't have a word about that uh, in uh, the uh, pact. So let's be uh, clear about that. It's not at all the a new foundation of the migration and asylum policy that uh, we uh, had, uh, that some persons had maybe uh, uh, expected. Some elements now uh, about what you have uh, in the pact. Well, first of all, I already mentioned it, the system of Dublin is still in the pact. And I have to say that it's quite unbelievable that the president of the commission and then commissioner uh, uh, Sinas uh, uh, later on have said, we abolish uh, Dublin, Dublin is not there anymore. I understand that you need to do political packaging when you present a set of new proposal, but I don't think that uh, adopting the methods of Donald Trump to try uh, uh, to uh, sell uh, the, uh, the pact is uh, good. To say that Dublin uh, is gone is simply a lie uh, and something uh, totally uh, uh, false. So we still have the big problem. The poison is uh, still uh, but the idea is now to try to correct as much as possible the effects uh, of uh, the Dublin mechanism by a mechanism of solidarity. And then let's think now about the type of solidarity that is envisaged in uh, the uh, pact, to make it simple, because it's extremely uh, uh, complex when you read uh, the legislative proposal. You have the possibility for member states to be solidar by uh, do accepting and doing relocation. You take some of them seekers of uh, member states who are uh, overburned. But you're not obliged uh, to do that because you can uh, also, as Lillian mentioned it, you can uh, do a return. And one state can say, well, instead of um, relocating uh, asylum seeker, I will uh, on the call take care of a certain number of persons, but with the idea to return them to uh, their uh, country of uh, origin. So the idea of uh, helping the states uh, overburdened by return is certainly uh, uh, good because uh, when you have asylum seekers, you have those who need to be relocated because we have the hope that they are uh, eligible as refugees, but uh, you have also those uh, who are not eligible and must be returned. And the burden of the return should not be left only on the shoulder of uh, the uh, states of uh, first uh, entry. But do we really have a pact when you think about the balance between those two uh, elements? Well, I think not at all, because actually the member states uh, about, again, solidarity and uh, uh, relocation can do what they cherish, which is uh, returning uh, people uh, in their country of, uh, of uh, origin. 
So they are not asked to contribute to uh, the uh, asylum uh, policy, and they can actually do exactly the contrary. Instead of welcoming people, they can show that they are solidar by uh, uh, returning people. And on that point, I think that there is not even a compromise between uh, the two groups uh, of uh, member states on that point. You just have a package where you put together those two opposite uh, visions, but they function in uh, parallel. So there is, in, on, in that point, no consensus uh, between uh, the uh, member states. And I think that's a very important uh, element because it means that actually migration and asylum will most probably remain a point of not consensus, but dissensus uh, between uh, the uh, member states uh, in uh, the uh, future. And uh, I could continue by taking uh, other elements, but uh, I will already uh, finish. Just a word about one element that Lillian had no time uh, to touch, but the, the financing and the multi-financial framework next uh, year, which is formally not part of the pact, but which is actually uh, an element uh, of the pact. When, when you look about the way uh, the funding for migration and asylum are going to be uh, distributed, in particular regarding asylum, you see that the member state who is going to get most of the money is Germany, and the member state who is going to lose money is Greece. Why? Well, the main element of response is that uh, Germany accepted one million of asylum seekers in 2016, and this is one criteria to share uh, the money, so the Germans uh, have a, a big pack of uh, the uh, money. But you may really wonder when it's about building an asylum policy, are the Germans in need of money? Do they not have uh, enough money for their asylum uh, system? And are the Greeks in a position that they don't need money? I think it is uh, exactly the uh, contrary. So it's amazing to see that at the moment that we discuss uh, solidarity in the pact, there is one element totally complementary uh, to the pact where solidarity is not implemented. And I think that this shows that we do not have a, a real pact. We do not have a, a vision uh, for uh, uh, the future. And we even do not have a global uh, understanding uh, of uh, the uh, system. And to finish, well, Lillian said that uh, she uh, would like to see the audacity uh, of uh, uh, hope. Maybe uh, I'm afraid to say uh, that I think that we must uh, expect the uh, pessimism for uh, tomorrow on the basis of the pact that we have now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor De Brecker or uh, Philippe, if I may. Um, so I think before we uh, enter into discussion with the audience, uh, Lilian, I can imagine that you want to uh, respond to the response eh? um, because uh, Philip gave some thought-provoking uh, messages. Um, first, the Dublin mechanism. There is no solidarity involved at all. You cannot talk about erosion of solidarity when there is no solidarity. That's the first uh, objection or, or reply. Second, there is no pact. There is no new migration pact, uh, was his criticism. Uh, and third, uh, financial means are not distributed in a just and fair way. Uh, the example of Germany and Greece. What is your reply to these three uh, uh, objections or uh, concerns? Yes, thank you. And uh, I will just start by saying that I am also proud to have an academic father like Philip. I will just leave it at that. But thank you, Philip, for your kind words and all your support. So on the points that he raised, I completely agree that uh, Dublin has been the original sin and remains so very much alive even in the new pact, despite the semantics thrown at us by uh, the European Commission. And it is, there have been different theories to explain what happened also at the initial stage and how uh, has it been uh, sustained. So theories uh, ranging from uh, well, the fact that there was a kind of exchange at this 
uh, initial points, so entry into Schengen with uh, accepting uh, the terms of Dublin for the member states uh, at the external uh, border, while also those member states, because at the beginning there was not also the related database, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, while they were thinking that, okay, in practice might not be able to be implemented so that they would never find, uh, for example, the individuals uh, that uh, crossed. Uh, then others have spoken the imagery so that even if Dublin for a long time didn't work uh, and there were in fact uh, secondary movements, that it was still important to keep this imagery uh, of uh, Dublin so as to repel, if you want, uh, an anti-factor uh, for the arrival uh, of uh, asylum seekers and the sustenance of the system. And others uh, have spoken about tolerated uh, non-implementation. So for different reasons, until 2015, 2016, while uh, the system uh, was not functioning uh, as, as it should, uh, there was this tolerated non-implementation of secondary movements, of perhaps not a thorough uh, registration, of uh, substandard conditions, and this was a kind of uh, a status quo uh, that was uh, favorable for everyone involved, and which was, of course, unsettled through the increased uh, arrivals in 2015. Uh, 2016. Uh, now, as as for the why it is still retained essence, both uh, in the 2016 proposals of the European Commission that I uh, did not mention because in their elements of solidarity in Dublin they have now been placed uh, by the new pact, is that the new solution that has been found is that of repelling, containing, externalizing, deflecting obligations rather than finding a viable, uh, let's say, system of responsibility allocation within the EU. So it is expected that so much effort uh, will go in deflecting protection obligations even before individuals, asylum seekers, arrive in the EU and then at the borders through for example, border procedures and returns, that the emphasis will be placed there. So there is no need, in essence, to untie fully uh, the Gordian knot. As for the funding, I didn't mention uh, the MFF but, uh, in detail, but I did mention that there is no uh, allocation of responsibility on the basis of uh, objective indicators. And in the same sense, this is mirrored, and as I told you, there, there is no way uh, where pressure is also relativized. As we said, 70,000, it's different in Malta, it's different in Germany. So it is, as Philippe has noted, very surprising that after so many iterations of migration funding, still we are speaking with absolute and not relative indicators. Still, we are talking about statistics which reflect the total number of those arrived since uh, some years back, <laughs> for example. And this cannot mirror, in fact, the real uh, structural needs that exist. Because sometimes you don't have a number of asylum applicants because you haven't managed to register them uh, to begin with. So. The problem is, is much deeper, but I will leave it at that uh, so that we can also have questions uh, from the participants who have been following us. Thank you so much, Lilian, and uh, let me profit from the occasion also to congratulate you on the professional presentation you have there eh, with the uh, EU stars and uh, uh, your uh, university banner there and so on. So it looks really great. Uh, yes, you mentioned our loyal uh, audience. Uh, they are still there. They are not so numerous, but don't forget um, the students of Helene. 
uh, will be able to watch this uh, uh, recording, recording of the session afterwards. So the the, audio, the audience is in fact uh, much much larger than it now appears. But they are uh, very loyal, and so I I'd like to experiment instead of uh, putting questions in the Q and A. We'll try with raising hands. You find a button at the right on the the bottom of your screen. You have the, the the button raise hands or hand obstaken in Dutch. So if someone from the audience wants to ask a question either to Lilian or to Philippe, please press raise hands and we'll make you a presentator and you can uh, use your microphone and ask a question. If that doesn't work, just put it in the Q and A. Uh, to everyone, and then uh, Lilian or Philip will answer it. So, the floor is now open for questions from the audience. Always hard to be the first. Thank you. Yes, I'll give the word to Martin Colin. I make you speaker. So now, Martin, you should be able to. Uh, ask your question okay just to check can you hear me yes we hear okay. you okay please speak loudly and clearly but we hear you yes okay um yeah i have probably quite a difficult question but i'll uh, i'll pose it anyways what would be so we, yeah, we heard a lot of uh, criticism uh, towards the new treaty uh, and my question would be, suppose that and take one or two measures uh, to to make it better, what would be according to you? Okay, can I ask this question or pass it to Philip first, because he was very critical of the new pact. So what measures we take? Well, it's of course uh, uh, difficult to, to to give an answer to to such a, a broad uh, question and uh, without having the time to to think of it. But I, I'm sorry to say that uh, uh, you should start from scratch because uh, I really don't see what is uh, important and uh, positive uh, in uh, the uh, pact. There is one element that I think. Uh, is really welcome. It's uh, the uh, mechanism uh, to control uh, the, what, uh, ha what's happening at the border and, uh, to put it clearly, to uh, have the possibility to control when member states uh, do uh, refoulement, so that uh, it's uh, then uh, possible to uh, uh, denounce uh, those uh, cases. But, but for the rest, honestly, as long as you, as you start from uh, the, the, the Dublin uh, principle, you are uh, in uh, trouble uh, because you need to try to correct uh, a system which is, goes entirely uh, against, uh, against uh, uh, solidarity. So the big question, I think, is would it be possible to find other criteria to share the uh, asylum seekers uh, between the member states then uh, the criteria of uh, first uh, entry. And that would, of course, I'm aware of that, uh, be extremely difficult because you, one thing is to say we erase Dublin because it's bad, but another is then, of course, to replace it by something that uh, is uh, acceptable. But for the moment, we don't have uh, uh, anything. We keep uh, uh, Dublin and we are going to uh, stay uh, in uh, that, uh, uh, to stay with that system. So uh, I'm sorry to say that I do not have uh, ideas uh, to make it good. I'm afraid that we should start to, to put it in the garbage and to start from scratch. Thank you. System errors, so we need to do control and uh, reinvent a new pact. But then, of course, this is a very difficult situation with uh, the policy balances or lack of balances in between member states of the EU. Lian, do you want to add something to this question? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, so I, I agree as well with uh, Philippe that it is difficult to fix uh, what is there. So some ideas for a more radical redesign, though, uh, Martin, and you are uh, right to reflect on this. I would say, first of all, more significant legal access pathways 
because now we have very few and also we utilize them very little. So, for example, refugee resettlements uh, compared, if you want, to the financial power and development of the EU as a region, we offer meager possibilities for resettlement. So, scaling up but significantly uh, resettlement. So, for now, it's in the thousands. 30, 40, 50, 60 thousands. Instead, who have said in 2015, 2016, these 1 million people who risked uh, their lives and were arriving in unseaworthy boats, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to say, we understand that this is in the neighborhood of the EU, we will resettle uh, 1 million, people, or we will create other pathways of legal access. So, this is not given, let's say, that there shouldn't be uh, any doors. Uh, and this is a uh, first element to, to start reflecting in the redesign. Now, as for internally, as Philippe said, it's very difficult to fix it while keeping Dublin or something like Dublin uh, in place. And you would need radical shifts in uh, the form, for example, of more centralized funding. So by that I mean EU funding in order to implement uh, asylum-related obligations to a significant extent, so much more than what is available now, which would reflect also the understanding of asylum provision as a regional public Good, but for that, you do not only need to change migration funding, you need to change the whole MFF, the whole EU budget, and how uh, much funding there is there and how much of it is uh, allocated to anything to do with the area of freedom, security, and justice, so as to pass more to a compensatory logic. This might be one way that could come either in parallel or alternatively with further administrative integration. And by that, I mean, for example, more centralization of uh, the provision of reception or uh, the provision uh, of assistance in order to assess the applications. For example, for them passing at EU level and having some kind of EU level response, this would necessitate change in the treaties, primary, secondary law. So I'm not saying that it's done like that, but as you ask us to reflect more broadly. So this would have been uh, another way, uh, for example, to uh, realize solidarity. All of these, as Philippe uh, said as well, necessitate a radical redesign. Perhaps we are taking baby steps of continuing to fail with what we do until uh, we accept one of these more uh, radical solutions, if you will. Thank you. Anyone from the audience who wants to ask another question, you can raise your hand virtually or ask a question in the q and A. I I will Grant Anna-Laure de Belly the floor. Yes, normally you should be able to speak. Hello. Hello, we hear uh, you. Yes, continue. Okay. So, uh, Professor de Brecker said that this new pact is not actually a pact. Um, but do you think that it will ever be possible to create a pact when there's so much non-consensus in the world surrounding this subject? Because to reach a pact, I do think you need to have a global or semi-global European consensus. How will we be able to create a pact when there's so much non-consensus? Thank you so much. It's a very clear question. Very hard to answer, I think. Hey, Professor De Breger, uh, yes. I will, uh, I will try. It's, it's indeed... Um, uh, a very uh, good uh, uh, question uh, and when I say that it's not a pact there is no consensus consensus I, I'm totally uh, aware about the fact that building a consensus uh, would 
uh, be uh, extremely uh, uh, difficult. But for instance, uh, I could imagine that instead of giving the possibility to member states to be solider uh, through uh, a return, it would have been much better to oblige them to be solidar solider, but within the area of asylum. So for instance, that uh, countries refusing relocation like uh, Hungary or uh, Slovakia uh, would uh, be uh, obliged, for instance, to contribute in money, financially or uh, in kind by sending a, a person, uh, per persons, per personnel to contribute to uh, the reception conditions uh, of asylum seekers uh, in Greece and in Italy. That would at least uh, have been a mechanism showing that there is an agreement uh, about uh, welcoming asylum seekers uh, in the European uh, Union. Now, indeed, uh, building a consensus uh, one day about migration will be uh, extremely uh, difficult. Uh, the 2015-16 uh, crisis has uh, terrible uh, consequences because actually we do not accept anymore politically what was happening, as Lillian mentioned, uh, on the ground, nobody saying and seeing uh, anything. Uh, before the crisis, there was a very good system of relocation. Asylum seekers were following their way uh, through uh, the, nord, uh, the northern countries of the European Union, and they were turning uh, a blind uh, eye uh, to uh, that. Now, in, unfortunately, with uh, uh, the crisis, uh, we are uh, now in a political climate uh, following which it is uh, unacceptable uh, to have uh, even a limited uh, a group of uh, irregular migrants trying to enter the European Union. Let's think of the, about the incredible negotiations that uh, the Commission is supposed to manage when you have a boat with 50 persons on board. It requires from the Commission to spend uh, days, if not weeks, on the phone to try to convince one member state to take five, another one to take uh, uh, three uh, persons. So the, the circumstances are extremely uh, uh, difficult. One element of hope uh, would be, nevertheless, the fact that migration is for the moment not anymore at the core of the agenda and at the top of the agenda. For the moment, the political agenda is focused on uh, the virus uh, COVID, is focused on the economical crisis uh, as a consequence of uh, the, the virus uh, crisis. So at least I think it would now be possible to uh, negotiate and to uh, discuss without a strong political uh, uh, pressure uh, around uh, demigration and uh, uh, asylum uh, question. But unfortunately, I don't think that we are going to, to, to launch uh, that uh, big uh, question. We just try to fix uh, here and there uh, a system that doesn't work and that will not work. And then I am afraid that in the future, if it doesn't work, the reaction will be worse because of what they member states will say, well, we, there is no way to fix that uh, system. So we cannot anymore welcome asylum seekers. I am afraid of an evolution uh, like uh, that. Thank you so much. Lilian, you want to comment further yes. or? Yes, okay. yes, yes, I do. So, Anelore, I think that uh, without any consensus, it's not only that you don't have facts, but you won't have agreements in what is there. In fact. So, it is impossible to move ahead without consensus. So, what the commissioner said. Uh, when the pact was released is uh, nobody uh, will be happy about what is there. But then some commentators said perhaps uh, this will be uh, the reason why uh, this will pass somehow miraculously, that even if in fact no one sees their views and preferences reflected there, it is enough of a wishy-washy thing that everyone is going to sign up to it. I don't believe so. And we have just finished four years, five almost, of political and legal blockage with uh, the 2016 proposals that actually lower. 
we have been having developments happening de facto, like the ASO involvement and no longer depicted uh, anymore fully accurately in law because there is no agreement on how to move ahead. And I don't think that unless some kind of consensus uh, is built, that we will be able to move ahead even with these uh, proposals that we have. So this not satisfying anyone and not addressing, let's say, anyone's needs, I don't think that we will come to some kind of lowest common denominator of agreement. I just think that the impasse will continue. So we do need bolder, if you want, discussions and to come to some core uh, of agreement, even in a controversial issue such as migration, external border control and, and refugee protection. Okay, thank you. It's uh, We're approaching uh, 7.30, half past seven. So I'd like to conclude. Uh, maybe there is room for one more question from the audience, if someone is willing. If not, I am willing. <laughs> it's okay. So the last question uh, is for Nicoletta. Hang on, I'll make you so technically. Now the microphone should uh, be open for you, uh, Nicoletta. Hello, Nicoletta, can you speak? microphone seems to be muted or the sound system does not work. Maybe you can ask to type your question in the chat. Hello, Nicoletta, can you speak or uh, put a message in the chat? Oh, there is a problem with the connection I see. Okay, so we leave uh, that question, unfortunately, uh, unless now she's, yeah, okay, Nicoletta, can you hear me? And speak, no. Okay, let me uh, ask a last question then. Uh, Lilian, you, you mentioned the growing uh, integration of the administration. Eh? Uh, as a as a kind of progress in the European system uh, policy system, uh, so that that uh, agentification that the, the IASO and so on could could uh, assist in implementing uh, policy norms or or uh, juridical principles uh, in the member states. But don't you fear that now with the COVID crisis uh, there is a tendency to even more nationalize competencies? Uh, for for the states and so on, so that this implementation and this uh, umbrella level of uh, institutions like the European Asylum Office will uh, be kind of a, a dead construction. That would be my question. So a comment on the COVID, the possible threat COVID, uh, the, the shadows COVID might might cast on the European Union, also in other areas. Eh? Uh, agriculture policy and so on. Uh, there are many areas where we see this, that, that actually the member states uh, take more power and uh, the European uh, umbrella level uh, wanes. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your uh, question, Stein. So I don't think that this will happen in the area of asylum because, uh, as I mentioned also in my talk, it was not some kind of federalist or integrative vision which has brought about uh, these developments that will be shaken by COVID, uh, but they have been brought there as a pragmatic solution. So the member states at the external borders continue to have structural needs, for example, Greece, Italy. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not something that is altered. If anything, it's maybe heightened also by COVID, what we will see becoming more difficult is the contributions of other member states to make uh, such uh, national experts ready for deployment, but the needs remain, especially they will even be heightened by this uh, new pact which foresees more intense uh, screening, etc., etc., and more activities uh, at the border. 
So to the extent that interstate solidarity has not been addressed uh, through other channels, it will remain a pressing need and, and the member states at the external border will be asking not for the intervention per se, but for this contribution. As, uh, uh, they will be able, if you wish, to implement these obligations. But yes, what will change might be how forthcoming the other member states will be to make these contributions and these uh, deployments. Okay, thank you so much, the two of you. So, uh, Philip and Lilian, thank you for uh, sharing all these thoughts with us uh, in a very uh, nice way. Also, you, it was very pleasant to listen to you. Uh, you were not just uh, like reading a text or something. It was uh, uh, the, the way of presenting was was also very nice. Uh, so I look also forward to, to maybe read uh, the interview with you in, in the book that uh, Helene uh, will also uh, publish uh, following this lecture. So that will be a very nice, these will be very nice interviews and conversations, I think, on, on very uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, themes. So let's hope for the best with the new pact, even if it is ha has a kind of diabolic system error, as uh, Philippe Breker uh, mentioned uh, several occasions. And yeah. Let's, let's conclude with the audacity of hope, with, uh, even if we're talking about European values, let's conclude with uh, an American president, uh, president's message, Barack Obama, with the audacity of hope against uh, the, the lies maybe from some EU talks that sound more Donald Trump when they uh, say that they have uh, um, yes, uh, uh, made improvements to the, the Dublin uh, mechanism. So we conclude. Uh, with these words, European values with uh, uh, wise uh, encouragement and words of the former president of the US, the audacity of hope. Let's hope for the best for asylum policy in the EU in the future. So, thank you. Have thank you so also. much, Enjoy also your for uh, your excellent okay. moderation. Thank you. Day and day. I thank uh, Marek Siris for technical <laughs> assistance and Bar Barbara Segar also for the organization. And of course, Helene Touquet, holder of the chair for European values, uh, for uh, cooperating with us uh, on these uh, important issues. And so, for, uh, from our team here in Campus Brussels, where you see the very yeah. professional. Yes, so we've theory. seen that. We noticed. Yes. yes. Thank, thanks to the whole team there. Thank yes. you. Okay. Bye. See you on another Uxia occasion. Bye.